Welcome to Transformations, Interviewing People Changing Our World. I'm your host, Diane J. Shaver, and our mission here is to demonstrate over and over again, one person, one decision, one commitment equals a world changer. And today's interview is with Jamie Margolin, world changer and founder of Zero Hour. Just give you some background on Jamie. She's a 17-year-old Colombian-American writer, community organizer, activist, and public speaker. She is the founder and co-executive director of the international youth climate justice movement called Zero Hour. And she led the very first Youth Climate May March, sorry, in Washington, D.C. and 25 other cities all around the world in the summer of 2018, and you all remember that. She is a plaintiff on Our Children's Trust Youth against the government of Washington State, a lawsuit suing the state of Washington for denying her generation's constitutional rights to a livable environment by continuing to make climate change worse. And she is a climate justice organizer in her local Seattle community. Her debut, her debut book, Youth to Power, Your Voice and How to Use It, is hitting bookstores worldwide in 2020. And I think there's a lot of, quotes, adults that need that book. So just a little bit about Zero Hour. I'll read some of their mission statements so um, you understand that this is a serious and powerful movement. The mission of Zero Hour movement is to center the voices of diverse youth in the conversation around climate and environmental justice. It's a youth-led movement creating entry points, training, and resources for young activists and organizers and adults who support them. And I will let Jamie tell you the rest of all of this because she's the most eloquent voice for Zero Hour and their mission. So let me introduce you now to Jamie Margolin. Welcome, Jamie. Hi, thank you so much for having me. This is really wonderful. I was so impressed with what you're doing and contrasting that to what's not happening uh, in Congress and the rest of business. So tell me what was it that led you to start that climate strike last year what what were you thinking what did you think you would accomplish and what did it accomplish well what led me to start the youth climate march um, on july 21st of 2018 was really a grand culmination of many different events that were happening in 2017 the year before so the united states pulled out of the paris accords um there was extreme weather patterns occurring all over the world um, that were very unusual, very terrifying, and the media was not reporting them fairly and not giving, not tying it into climate change. And then um, to make matters worse, Hurricane Maria happened and there was a horrible response to that and that a lack of support and that was very much climate worse and disaster. Um, now, all of these other issues were happening and no one was taking action. And this was before Greta Thunberg started her climate strike. This was before the uh, mainstream youth climate movement. And um, I was just like, there has to be mass mobilization. We can't let this stuff slide anymore. And so with that, I decided, you know what, screw it. We have to have a youth climate march because this is our future and this is it's deteriorating and this is not okay. And so I posted on social media that I was gonna organize the Youth Climate March and asked whoever wanted to join me and a bunch of people joined me. And from then on, we spent a year building this movement and then the next year we had the march and the rest is history. And did that march um, accomplish what you wanted? Did people start paying attention, do you think? Um, people did start paying attention. It, it kind of shifted the way that the, it lay, well, first of all, it laid the groundwork for Greta Thunberg's climate strike and it laid the groundwork for the school strike for climate and Fridays for Future movement. So that made a huge impact. And it also started to shift the way the media talked about the climate crisis with more and more urgency. We really played a part in that shift. So that was really important. Cool. And what is the vision of Zero Hour? In the, the broad vision, where you are now, um, what do you want to see happen this year? So we just finished the Youth Climate Summit, which took place in Miami, Florida, um, July 12th through the 14th. It was like a massive, it was a massive event. Um, and we trained 350 young people in Miami to be climate justice activists because Miami is on the front lines of the climate crisis and will be underwater soon. And so we did all that work. 
um, we, we put together this mobilization in Miami. So this is our second big mobilization. And then we were also doing a bunch of like different trainings um, with young people all around the country, different speaking engagements. So this year we're gearing up for the climate strike, September 20th, the Earth Day 50th anniversary, and a bunch more speaking engagements and campaigns. So we're only going to get bigger and stronger this year. I love it. I love it. Do you think that quotes, are, I hate using the combination of youth and adult. It just feels like people. Yeah. And I mean, you guys are obviously people. It doesn't matter your age. Do you feel like people are starting to understand? Do you think they're starting to get it that we're in a crisis? I feel like people are finally starting to understand that we're in a crisis. Yes, I feel like the urgency is stacking up and, and people, people are getting it. Um, but it's it's taking a while and it's it's taking a while and it's too little too late but we're still doing it we got to still do the work because this is the future of our planet that's at risk right now so if we don't if we don't take action now then it's going to be too late so i think it's a good start but we need to be doing a lot more yeah because james anderson of harvard university said we don't have 10 years we have five years that was his last thing so i mean it, it, yeah. it is escalating and one of the things that I think there's a debate sometimes with people of why this, whether this is caused by human activity or it's also something that happened on the planet because the, the axis shifted, Earth's axis shifted, and it did cause some of that. But my sense is no matter what caused it, the issues are still the same. Yeah, well, that's... First of all, that's not up for debate. Everyone knows what actually caused this crisis. And so, right. um, I'm not even going to indulge. I'm not even going to give. Um, I'm not even going to give the benefit of the doubt to any of these ridiculous theories. When 97% of the scientific consensus is that climate change is man-made and it's caused by emissions that we have been emitting and the destruction of our wildlife and all of that. Um, I'm not even going to go into it because that science is easily accessible, and I'm not even going to give those theories don't even deserve time um but yeah i mean no matter even if you want to be out here speculating why and what like the 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 solutions that we need are still the same and the problem is still the same so we have to be addressing it are you um going to corporations and businesses as well um what, yes. what are you doing yeah. So the September 20th, um, I'm actually organizing a climate strike on Amazon headquarters um, because where I live in Seattle, we have a lot of corporate headquarters, mainly the Amazon corporate headquarters. And there's a lot of corporations that while the governments are being held accountable, at least trying to be held accountable um, for the climate crisis, corporations are kind of quietly sneaking by and destroying all life on earth. And they are the ones um, who have the government on, pup on puppeteer strings. So by holding these corporations accountable, that is what I am doing. Um, it's not specifically just Amazon, it's just that Amazon happens to be the corporate headquarters closest to my home, but it's a climate strike for corporate accountability on the climate crisis. What about oil companies? Have, have you had any access to any of the people there? Do you think there's any hope of them listening? Um, I feel like there has to be because otherwise we wouldn't be doing this. It's not a matter of hope like, hey, can you please listen? It's a matter of we will be out there protesting and yelling and fighting until you do listen. Right. So it's either you, you know, there, there's no choice. One of the things that strikes me that corporations and businesses are missing that with all of the green things that we're talking about and, and changing to wind and solar and so forth, there's whole new industries, whole new jobs. I mean, there's a whole new economic thing that will, would result from that, which is a language that most of the corporations understand. Do you have a sense of why they're not picking that up, why they're not seeing that? Um, I mean, it's not a matter of them not understanding it. It's a matter of... Um, it's a matter of them making money off of, it's a matter of them making money off of making the climate crisis worse. So they profit off of worsening the climate crisis. They profit off of endangering all life on earth. And so um, they understand like Shell Oil and all of these other corporations that are causing the climate crisis, they know what's up. 
um, they know what they did and they know the science because they are working so hard to cover it up. Um, like you see, like the, none of this is a surprise to these massive corporations, but they make money off of it, and so they're just fine destroying everything because they're it, because of the short term profit. There was a, a joke circulating on Facebook, and it said, "If you can't breathe, counting your money won't matter." And exactly. So, so what, it, it stymies me. How can these people? do that because they're going to be as affected as anybody else. Their, their families are going to be affected. No one is, is, you know, immune to this. What do you think goes through their minds? I think it's not like, I think what goes through their minds is like the bottom line. You know, they're in that big corporate space. They seem untouchable. They're at their big desks. They, they have all this money. Like they don't really understand what most people go through and they're not really, they're not really thinking about the actual consequences of their actions. They're just thinking about what they're getting in the short term. And it's that addictive, I want it, I want it um, kind of thing of, of more money, more money, more money. It's never enough. So I really think that's, that's, that's what's going on through their mind. They're not just like, hmm, I'm going to kill my son's future today. It's just what, what the side effect of their greed but also their own future because um, ten, let's say we do have 10 years. That's, that's not very long. And for most of these corporate executives, they're still going to be around when, but, but they, they have the privilege in that they're, you know, the people who are rich and have a lot of money and have a lot of resources can easily move, can easily go to places that are less affected by the climate crisis. It's the poorer people who will be feeling the worst effects. So they can kind of, even though if, even while the rest of the world is suffering, these people at the top can kind of maneuver for a little bit longer. For a little bit longer is the key thing because eventually, I mean, air is air. It travels all over the planet. That's true. But uh, the poor communities are hit the worst. And so, unfortunately, that's, that's, that's the reality. Okay. So what, what is your vision? What, what is the vision that you carry for Zero Hour? The mission I carry for Zero Hour is that we are um, a mass movement that is unignorable that we become a powerhouse in the climate justice movement, that we are a movement of young people that pushes the needle towards change, that mobilizes in larger and larger amounts, that trains and educates in larger and larger amounts, that builds more and more political power so that we cannot be ignored, um, that the policies change, that our governments are held accountable, and that every time you turn on the news, you see kids taking action for the climate. So you'll be able to uh, vote in 2020. Um, I will be able to vote in 2020. Do you think that um, youth will be mobilized? Because the last election, there were millions of people who did not vote. Do you think this will change with what you're doing? Um, I really do think that this will change. I mean, I'm so excited to be voting in my first election. And I know so many of my peers are super pumped to be voting. I just hope that the Democratic Party chooses a candidate that is not... Um, you know, that, that takes the climate crisis seriously and to the full extent and is not in the pockets of the fossil fuel industry because um, there are a few in there who are, but I'm really excited to be voting and I think that definitely what Zero Hour is also going to be doing is a lot of voting push. I love that. And the millennials, which are older than you, um, there's more millennials and people my age now, so if they get out and vote, so is there something that Zero Hour will be doing about getting people to vote? or making them aware of, of the consequences of not voting? Um, something that Zero Hour is doing. I mean, we're just doing a lot of also, we're going to be doing at our mobilizations, a lot of different voter registration and um, making sure that making sure that young people know exactly how to vote because a lot of times it's it's not that young people don't want to vote it's that it's made extremely difficult by a lot of these people in power a lot of these states that want to disenfranchise youth votes especially youth of color and people of marginalized circumstances um i think that what's going to happen is a lot of community resilience and a lot of um, organizers coming up with ways to make voting um, a lot of ways to make voting easier um, because right now a lot of politicians would not benefit from having young people vote because 
young people voting means that they get voted out of office because we have opinions about um, the climate crisis and we care about these issues that they are destroying. So we have to fight back against voter suppression and redlining and all of those things. Absolutely, absolutely. That, that's huge right now. And we saw a lot of what happened with the last election. You know? Yeah. Um, people were disinvited to vote. And I live mm -hmm. in Charleston, South Carolina, which has a huge African-American population. And it was very difficult for them to vote as well. Um, talk to me a little bit, if you would, and I'll look at, uh, about the suit against um, the state of Washington. Yeah, so even before I started Zero Hour, I was a climate justice activist in my state of Washington. Um, in Washington state right now, people think that it's a, you know, it's a green state, that everyone is taking action, that everyone is, um, that it's just like perfect and all our governor and our legislature is perfect on the climate crisis. But in reality, there's new fossil fuel infrastructure being built here. There is new, um, people are being hurt by the climate crisis here in Washington state every day. The state of the wildlife is deteriorating and it is, um, the orca and the salmon are dying, the oceans are acidifying, and right now our governments are continuing to make the climate crisis worse. And so I'm a part of a lawsuit filed by Our Children's Trust, which is an organization that helps young people uplift, um, that helps uplift young people's voices um, by suing, by helping us sue our governments, saying that they're denying our rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that is guaranteed to us uh, by continuing to make the climate crisis worse and by continuing to side with the fossil fuel industry. So, um, so that's really what we're fighting for. And, and if we win that lawsuit, then the core mandated climate recovery plan that they would have to implement, um, which would be super historic. And there's another like lawsuit that is taking this on the national level, the Juliana versus the United States. I'm a part of the Aji Piper versus the state of Washington. Um, and that's still going through the courts, so we'll see what happens. So do you have any kind of time frame for these suits? Have you told anything about them? Um, I mean, these things lag on forever. The government is keep trying to push back, push back, silence us. So there's no time frame. But if you want to follow along, you can go to uh, ourchildrenstrust.org. Um, or Youth v. Gov on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and find out more about the lawsuits, keep up with the lawsuits and um, what is happening with them, because that is a continual work in progress, and there is more than just one. Good. There's the other thing that struck me too, and your pledge for elected officials. It, it's like, dear elected officials, we the youth demand that you reject the corrupting monetary influence of fossil fuel executives, lobbyists, or their front groups and commit to protect our health, climate, and democracy instead. And then you had a whole list of things. Where, where is that? What are you doing with that? Are, are any of the um, people in, are you listening to that? Or what's the response? I mean, there are several politicians that are not taking money from the fossil fuel industry and that are listening to our lobbying and listening to what we're doing and refusing money, but we have a long way to go. Okay, so what, what is the pledge? And how does it work? And what are you doing with it? Because I loved it. I read all of it and it was wonderful. So the no fossil fuel money pledge is pretty much a pledge that we are working with our partner, the Sunrise Movement to get as many politicians as possible to sign, which is pretty much pledging that they will not take any fossil fuel money whatsoever for their campaigns, m government, whatever, no fossil fuel money. Because if they take fossil fuel money, that means they owe the fossil fuel industry something in return. And we cannot have any politicians in office who are in, under the puppet strings of the fossil fuel industry. So that is super important that that does not happen. Um, so that is what we're working on. And we're making sure that, I mean, at, it, for me, it's so important that my next president, that my congressperson, that my senator is not in the pockets of an industry destroying my life and my future. Well said. So have you had response to that already? Yeah, I mean, like, there are a lot of Paul, like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren and others who are, like, refusing to take money from the fossil fuel industry after the Sunrise Movement and us, like, have been pushing them. Um, but they were already good on that issue anyway, at least Sanders was. Um, so, I mean, and, and then, like, my, my congresswoman, Pamela Jayapal, is very good on that. And then there are a lot of 
like the justice Democrats who are going on that. So there, there's definitely a shift, but it needs to happen a lot quicker. Right. So what do you see going on in Congress that makes them so oblivious to this? I mean, I know that it's money. And I, I keep coming back to the same thing, and that is to live on this planet. I don't care how rich they are, unless they live on the moon, they're going to be affected. So what, what do you think you need to do in order to get them to get it? Well, they're, the only way that they're going to get it is that if we tell them that we're going to vote them out if they don't understand and if they don't take action, like, there's no convincing, there's no words you can say to these people who have their hands so deep in the fossil fuel industry's pockets that it, it, there, there's just, there's such a cognitive disconnect. Like there's no, they're so rich. They're so, um, it, it's just, it's just impossible um, to, to, to face to face conversation because people have tried and tried tried and been like i'm dying i'm whatever like even with like the healthcare thing you can look mitch mcconnell right in the face and be like your policy will kill me and he'll just whatever so we have to vote them out and then once they lose their jobs and it hits them in the pocketbook that's when you they realize that's the only way i like that and i like that they're that you all are moving toward making you aware that you have to vote and how to protect um, that vote. Um, one of the things that's really interesting, and I don't know what you think on this, is that nobody in Congress seems to serve, or most, let me put it that way, I said the wrong thing, most people in Congress do not seem disturbed by the fact that um, our, our um, last year, uh, two years ago, um, presidential campaign was hacked by the Russians. No one seems to be concerned about that. What, what no, is, and really, in order to solve the climate crisis, we're going to have to fix our democracy as well. Like, we're going to have to have more politicians like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and the Justice Democrats and all of these other things. Um, so it's really concerning, and I'm really worried about definitely the Russian meddling and the way that our administration is just bending over and letting that happen because it benefits them. It does. It does. Um, and the other thing I was thinking, too, is that... Um, I suppose each one of us can go to our congressperson that is somewhat open and begin to get them involved. But it, it feels like even the candidates um, and the debates are not talking about this issue. Why do you think that is? I mean, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie have not talked about that. And I worked for Bernie when he ran last time. So I, you know, I know that he, his heart's in the right place, but they're not talking about it. Why do you think that is? I think there's just so many issues like what right now the the tactics that are um, that the opposition um, is using is overwhelming us with so much rapid response kids in cages they, you know this that that we're just like we're constantly responding to crisis after crisis after crisis that there's there's no time to actually be like what's the long-term threats here what are we working on like it's just it's a very smart tactic if they're just bombarding us so we're constantly on the offense on the defensive so we can't be on the offensive yeah what do you think about, in, in that light, think about the move for impeachment, which would be another distraction? I don't think that impeachment would be another distraction. I really am an advocate for impeachment um, because if we don't, like, then that's saying that that behavior is okay. If Congress, just the act of impeaching, even though I know that the Senate is not going to actually convict because it's a Republican Senate and they've lost their backbone, but that impeachment has to happen and it wouldn't be a distraction. It would be very, very important to, to say that this is not okay, to set a precedent that this is not okay because if impeachment does not happen, then it sets a precedent that, that this behavior, that this violation of human rights and disrespect to the highest office in the land is okay. Yeah. But he's been doing that. Nobody has stopped him all the way through from his campaign all the way through. He's been consistent and ignoring um, the fact that a country needs a, a governing person who has heart, who cares about things. And that's been all the way through. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's really frustrating. One of the things, too, that I, I want to get your take on is that many of us who are listening to all the debates, there, there's a concern. If we need to get more people to vote for a Democrat. 
and a lot of um, the Republicans are <laughs> kind of disturbed finally by some of the things that are going on. So they're looking at Democrats. So there's this kind of twofold thing. One, we need somebody that will not scare the Republicans that are disenfranchised and want to vote Democrat. And then, then the other part of it is, is what you said, people who are having a new vision. So how do you see that, those two things working together? I mean, the way I see those things working together is that we, we ultimately, what has to happen in order for us to survive this is that we look at not the party line, but the actual policy. And if you look at the policies that are going to be helping us get out of this climate crisis, that is all on the left. And that is who people are going to have to grow up and vote. Maybe, you know, maybe they don't agree with everything that a candidate does socially or whatever, um, fiscally, but at the end, you got to vote for the candidate that's going to put saving the world over saving their wallet. And so that's, that's just what has to happen. And so I really hope people will grow up and, um, grow a pair and and do that even if they have to swallow you know their their normal conservative ideals and just vote for the vote for the right candidate that's what they're going to have to do but the the point is i think that um people get caught between two things and one is having a candidate that will have wide appeal and having a candidate who's going to make a sweeping change so sometimes you have to deal with um, doing things incrementally, which I, I'm not talking about years, but I'm talking about getting at least a Democrat in um, as president, and then from there, bringing to bear um, some of the forces of, of making the changes. So do you sit with that at all, or do you feel like it has to be radical? Because my concern is that if it is very radical, we're going to lose a lot of votes and we'll be... And we'll we have to... It's not a matter of what's radical and what isn't, of what's, um, you know, of what's left and what's right. It's about what is... We can't get too caught up in, like, the opinions. that We have to focus on what actually physically needs to happen in order for us to... Um, in order for us to have a livable planet. So in order for us to have a livable planet, we have to get down to 350 parts per million by the end of the century, which means lowering our emissions by about 12% every single year. And if we start later, that goes up to like 15% next year and uh, over and over. And whatever policies have to happen for that to happen, have to happen. So yes, they are going to have to be radical and people may not like it. But in the end, it's not about what is most popular. It's about what physically needs to happen. And that is that. I, I understand. I agree with you. However, if we don't have somebody in place as a president who will do, who will at least listen, then it's a moot point at that point. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? And I think that's where people are getting caught. I mean, you're right. There's, there's no question. You're right. Absolutely. But what if we have somebody who's very radical running <clears throat> for president I feel like very radical is a lot better. I feel like what's going to doom us is if we try to play it safe, if we try to vote for candidates who are not even really that good, who do not excite the base, um, who do not, you know, who do not excite people. That is really just signing. If we try to play it safe, then that is, that is really what's going to kill us. And so we have to go if, you know, Trump is the opposite of safe. So we have to have a candidate that matches that, the complete opposite of safe, the complete opposite of the aisle. Um, trying to play middleman, you know, the actual base is not going to turn out. Young people are not going to turn out for someone bland, for someone who does not fulfill what we need to happen. We're just not going to turn out. Do you think that's true of the millennials as well? Millennials will not turn out. The uh, people of color will not turn out. The marginalized communities will not turn out. If they feel it's the same, like I feel like the media is is making a big mistake by just saying, "Oh my God, we have to play it safe." Who could actually beat Trump? And I'm like, "How could you know that?" Because the polls were wrong last year, the last election, and so we shouldn't vote for like, "Oh, who could beat Trump?" Because in the end, we have to rally around whoever the Democratic candidates and that candidate has to be someone who actually fulfills what we need them to do do you see candidates that are like that i see a few i haven't endorsed officially but i really like bernie sanders and elizabeth warren um i think they're my top picks right now but uh we'll see okay i i like that i mean one of the things that i see and 
I don't know how to say this, I don't want to be offensive, but I need to say it. And that is when we're young, we are so clear about what is right. And then as we get older, we get so pushed and pulled in so many different directions. So I love that you are focused and clear and not pushed and pulled in, in many directions. So what, how do you see your role in the election process? Will, will you endorse somebody? Um, I will endorse somebody eventually. Right now I'm still waiting. I'm still watching. I'm still seeing the debates. I'm still, I'm still doing it, but um, I, I, I'm going to hold off on endorsing just yet, but I will be endorsing someone and then I will be campaigning for that person. But then obviously whoever the Democratic candidate is, I will be rallying around. Um, whether I'm that excited about them or not, you know, it, we have to get Trump out of the office. But that's why I'm saying we need someone who's really exciting and someone who's actually fulfills what we need them to do because otherwise um, people won't be excited and we need to have a candidate who's exciting, not who's boring. I love it. Okay, and what about the carbon tax? Um, the Citizens Climate Lobby, I see, is one of the people, one of the groups you're affiliated with. And what do you think? Not really. I'm not really that affiliated with them, actually. They're on your website. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're par we're, we're partner. We've partnered with them and stuff yeah. on stuff, yeah. but we don't endorse that carbon tax. No, it's not strong enough. And it harms a lot of um, the communities that are worst affected by it. It's not strong enough for those communities. And we typically carbon taxing is not the end all be all of solutions. So, I mean, yeah, we're partners with Citizens Climate Lobby. We'll work on them with a few things, but I we're not really big advocates for that legislation. So I wouldn't really go there in terms of asking me like why it's good and why, because um, it's just not something we endorse. Okay, I didn't know that because I saw them there. Um, well, yeah, so the people on our website are just people that we've worked with or, or we support each other. It's not like we support every single policy that they have. Okay, I got it. So what, what do you think needs to happen? I mean, like step one, step two, step three, just walk us through that. What needs to happen now? Well, for now, I guess if, if I could wave a wand and make what needs to happen to happen on the climate crisis, step one, declare a federal national climate emergency and have, you know, that state of emergency because that's really what we're in. Step two, halt uh, all new fossil fuel infrastructure, start immediate transition onto renewable energy, um, mass funding of renewable energy, passing of the Green New Deal, passing of the climate recovery plan of what we, um, the young people are suing our governments for that you can find more about the climate recovery plan on ourchildrenstrust.org um, as well as some aspects of it are on this is zero hour.org's platform. Um, and there needs to be sweeping changes, reforestation, halting of all deforestation, just like massive over system overhaul is really what needs to happen in order for us to survive this. Have you approached any members of Congress to talk about this, to see about getting the um, department in the state department or wherever where this is classified as a crisis? Um, I mean, right now with the current Trump administration, there isn't much that we can do with that. So I'm just waiting. Uh, we just have to wait right now for the next, for the next um, administration. So right now all the action needs to be taken locally. And um, if every state, every city is taking action, then eventually once the administration switches, then, then, we'll, then we can immediately transition into that. Do you see states now that you could approach with that that would be more amenable? California, Washington State, Oregon, um, all of these other, all of these other um, states. I really feel like there's there's a possibility. So has anyone approached them? Have you approached them as a group? Have we approached these as a group? I mean, the state governments. I mean, Zero Hour hasn't, but a lot of our members have. Yes. Cool. Because there were a lot of um, governors and mayors that went to the Paris talks, even though the United States itself was not represented as a country, there were people who went. And if you could connect with those people, perhaps that would be an opening? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And I feel like, I feel like there is an opening, but I also feel like there's a lot of work done locally and, and a lot of local activists are taking action that needs to happen in those communities. 
Okay. So how do you see zero hour working with those local things? So is, is it that you're... We support, we have local... Um, we have local uh, sister chapters in our, um, we have local sister chapters in our, as a part of Zero Hour. So a lot of time, the way that we support locally is we support people taking action locally in their communities um, through our chapters. So we have local Zero Hour chapters that will go lobby, that will go take action, that will go do things in, in their own communities. Um, and so we, we support those that way. So are you seeing zero hour more as an educational? Um, it's a mobilization. Um, it's a mobilization organization. So um, most of what we do is a combination of culture shift, education, and pressure. Right. And so I really like that you work with the other groups. So it makes it very clear how this should be so it's not redundant so people aren't doing the same thing and not getting results but if if you are like the vision i would call you a vision keeper your organization a vision keeper for what needs to happen and how it needs to happen and then the local groups and and other groups the ones to carry it out does that sound like something that feels like what your vision is yeah yeah definitely okay. So what have we not covered that you want to say to people? What do you want them to understand that we haven't covered? I want them to understand that we are in a state of emergency and that we need all hands on deck. No one can be sitting back and saying, oh, the young people will do it. Oh, you will save us. Oh, you're so impressive. But I'm going to go sit back, relax, and do whatever. Like, everybody has to be on this. Everybody has to be chipping in. Everybody has to be doing their part. And little individual actions will not cut it. We have to have mass system change, which means that everyone needs to be pressuring our governments and pressuring everyone to take action. So you see that the individual... Uh, work is really to get to our politicians and to vote in or out depending on what they're as well as corporations yes okay and how can we deal with corporations what what is your suggestion well the, it's the same those corporations you put public pressure that you can boycott you can um you can just raise it you can you can complain to the corporate ceos and you can just raise like what i'm doing with the september 20th strike on amazon just just making a a statement that anything under anything other than mass urgent action on the climate crisis is un, is going to be unacceptable. So, what do you, how do you see them responding? What do you want them to do? I want them to all the corporations to immediately transition to one hundred percent renewable energy, especially the big ones who have the money and funding to make it happen. I want them to start um, if they are a fossil fuel corporation to start transitioning to a different form of business to different renewable energy, um, and that all needs to happen like immediately. Okay. Do you have like a game plan that you give to these people when you talk to them, rather than saying this is what needs to happen? Do you have a game plan for them? Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, it depends, but really like it's not the young people's job to have everything lined up. We tell them what we need to do and they have the resources and the people and the researchers to make it happen. So it's really not fair to say that a 17 year old should have all of that prepared. Well, I'm not saying that at all. No, no, I'm saying that to them. Yeah. Okay. But so let, what I'd like to line out for people is, okay, you have the vision and you know what needs to happen. So your job is to bring that the attention of people and then the next step is that there needs to be some kind of organizing thing people will not act by themselves they most of the time they just won't so we need the next kind of organizing thing what would that next organizing body look like the next organizing body looks like is extreme action on climate through the sense of um you know there's not one organization that's going to save us all it's going to be like you know, Zero Hour is working on mobilizing. Sunrise Movement is working on mobilizing. All these other organizations are working on mobilizing. So people just need to plug into those already existing networks as soon as possible, as much as possible. And we all need to be doing our part for those networks. Okay. That's why organizations exist. Correct. It's just that I think there needs to be a game plan. And I want to work on that too from, from the motivation to actually making it happen and, and right. what is going to make people feel like 
empower, I think one of the things, people feel powerless. That's one of the worst things that's going on. And that's why I'm doing what I'm doing is to make people see, yeah, if you have an idea, yeah, you can make this happen. So what is it that's going to energize people to take that power and to do it? That's the next piece. That's the, to me, for me, the missing piece is how to get these people once they realize they need a leader, they need somebody who is going to do this. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But but a lot of there it, there doesn't have to be one supreme leader of, of the whole. No, I'm not talking about that. But I mean, right. there has to be a um, category of of groups that are saying this is what we're going to do, and um, so I'm I'm just chewing on that for myself and think right. about what that's going to look like and right. how how I want to be involved in that because something needs to happen. Exactly. Right. So. Yeah, definitely. So any last thoughts before we say goodbye and thank you? That is all. Um, I would just say that to please support the Zero Hour movement. We have a lot coming up when we need your help. So you can go to thisiszerohour.org to support us. Um, you can find all the information about us there. You can also follow us um, on social media. It's at This Is Zero Hour on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And you can find me on social media just under Jamie Markle. Okay. And just one second about your book. Talk to us about your book. What you oh, want yes. And I have a book coming out. Um, if all goes well, the book is coming out next year in 2020. Um, it's an ultimate guide to being a young activist, your voice and how to use it. It's all about community organizing as a young person. It's just the ultimate guide, but it could also be used by adults for how to organize. So um, if you follow me on social media, Jamie Margolin on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, I will post the pre-order link soon. Um, it's still in the editorial stages, but um, it should be on bookshelves all around the world, hopefully by this time next year because that sounds like something that we need so jamie yes. we need to run thank you so much for your time thank you for what thank you so much and we will figure out how to do all of this together yes okay thank you thank you bye 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 thank you to our listeners for being with us and for um having the chance to listen to Jamie Margolin for Zero Hour and all the other things that um, she's doing and watch for her book. I can't wait for that. I think there's a lot of adults that need that book. So again, with um, Transformations Podcast, Interviewing People, Changing Our World, I want you to begin to understand that it just takes one person, one decision, one commitment, and you can change the world. And right now we need everybody stepping up and doing whatever it is for them in small ways and big ways. It doesn't have to be a standout thing. It doesn't have to be somebody that I'll come and interview. It's just in whatever you need to do. And one of the things that's very clear from talking with Jamie and from everything else is that we are in a climate crisis and that behooves each one of us to do whatever we can do. So I will be interviewing someone else who is a world changer um, very shortly. In the meantime, you can listen to the other and watch the other podcasts that have preceded this. Just go to www.transformationspodcast.com and they're all there. And you also can go to Facebook and subscribe to our channel. And right now the way to do that is to type in my name and it's all caps. D-I-A-N-N-E, -N -N -E. and again, caps, S-H-A-V-E-R, and that will take you right to um, YouTube channel, and uh, you can subscribe, and we'll make sure that you get all the latest ones. You can also find us on Facebook at Transformation Podcast, Interviewing People, Changing the World. So I look forward to next time when I interview someone who is going to change the world and you can listen to them and be inspired and be someone who is a world changer. Bye-bye.